support those salespeople and helping them think about how do they provide additional value beyond the self-service purchase, right? That's the first thing. And then the, the, the next thing is letting them know like, look, you, those are probably lower value customers and we wanna get you focused on the right customers and actually having product-led growth will help us get you focused on the right customers. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's like you, you have to, there's definitely some hearts and minds. And I think there's a lot of like lack of understanding of how product-led growth works from a sales perspective. Hey everyone, George Soto here, and you're watching the Product-Led Revenue Show. Today, I'm joined by Atlanta, Georgia-based Thomas Shields, who's a product marketing executive at Mural. How are you? Hi, it's great to be here. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't know if I told you, but I lived in Georgia, particularly in Atlanta, about 17 years ago. Time flies. It's kind of oh, wow. Weird but I worked for a medical software startup in Midtown and lived off of Far Road in Buckhead before they kind of like tore it apart. And I think now it's like a luxury shopping area or something. Oh, wow. But back then it was kind of a fusion between like, you know, a lot of partying, which I did a lot of at that time because I was fresh out of college, what could I say? And, uh, and then some other uh, areas. So have a small, um, you know, sort of like a soft spot for, uh, for Atlanta. But why don't you tell folks a little bit about your career background? You've been in Atlanta working for some of the most innovative technology companies in SaaS. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and yeah, happy to share a little bit about my experience. Um, you know, I've been in product marketing for B2B SaaS companies for almost 10 years now. And Prior to that, I actually had a kind of a, a second career uh, in education, working in charter schools. So I was a teacher and then helped uh, kind of grow a charter school, uh, which I actually think was a really interesting um, background to get before getting into product marketing. Um, but I went to business school, found product marketing technology, and just kind of fell in love with, with that Um I started my career in education technology with a company that was, you know, early in product-led growth, um, where we were marketing to teachers and students. Then I moved um, on to um, a couple of B2B marketing technology companies. One was called Terminus that was really pioneering account-based marketing, and then moved over to a, a small startup called Matcha that was recently acquired that, um, had a uh, content marketing software for small e-commerce businesses. And uh, most recently I joined a company called Mural. Um, this is a company that has, you know, we've had really explosive growth over the past year. Um, we offer a visual collaboration um, tool. You know, it's essentially a digital workspace. Most people would consider it an online whiteboard, but we really think of it as a lot more than an online whiteboard. It's a, um, it, it has those functionality that you would expect, but beyond that, it also allows you to uh, collaborate more easily, run better meetings. Uh, it's got tools for that. It's got um, templates so that you can run like structured um, collaboration se sessions uh, with people, you know, in the office when we were back in the office or, you know, on the globe, across the globe, remotely, wherever. Um, and so what I do there is I'm leading or have been leading our efforts to um, kind of release and launch new features um, to, all, to all of our users. Yeah. Awesome. Well, shout out to Sangram and Eric. I know the early team there yeah. at, uh, at Terminus, Terminus yeah. and Flip My Funnel, all those folks. I got a lot of love for those folks. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about like, uh, you know, of course, product led. And why is it like, first of all, what the heck is it, right? In your yeah. opinion, you know, I think you have a really interesting background. And why is it so popular right now? Because it's not new, but this, of course, this category now has emerged the last few years. Right. Yeah. So that, um, I think that's a great question. You know, it, what it is, is fairly simple. Um, it, it's really a go-to-market strategy that relies on your product. 
It relies on the product as you know the key driver of acquisition, adoption, expansion, and retention, right? Like the kind of basic elements of, of, of uh, SaaS growth. Um, but I I think it you know when you dive into it, you can get a little more detailed. So product like growth can doesn't have to occur across all of those aspects of the funnel, right? It with acquisition, it could be something that supports just generating kind of demand or, or awareness. It could be a lead uh, acquisition tool. It could be, a, you know, for sales, it can be a qualification tool. It can help with consideration all the way down to, you know, purchasing and product, which is what people think of most commonly. Um, I think adoption makes a lot of sense to people. Um, I think of expansion as like, is your product viral in nature or does it allow, and or does it allow for like upgrade in app? And then retention's like well, probably the most straightforward part is like, can you re-up uh, within, within the app? Does the product let you do that? So that's what it is very simply. I think um, your question about why is it so hot right now is really interesting. Um, and I think we need to like kind of go a layer down and understanding what product like growth is. And it's at its core element, it's simply users like can see the value of the product um, immediately or, or, or very quickly, let's just mm -hmm. say, right. They can get in the product and they, they can understand the value instead of needing to uh, read a white paper like we used to do back in the day. Or try to so, figure out what the copy is on the website, right? The fancy Right, exactly, right? Like, like uh, the, the, the website now assists what the experience of the product versus the other way around. Um, I like and that. I think oh. like it's, there, like you said, this has been around for a while. You know, companies like um, Dropbox, even, um, you know, some of the like super early like email services were using mm -hmm. some of this. The mail the, the, and those folks. Yeah, like yeah. I've been using this for a while. I think what's what's happening now is that this strategy is that we've figured out enough about how to use it to drive growth to make it really productive. So it's kind of like at peak productivity. Um, and it's there because of kind of like, I, I think there's like a few trends that have just like collided, right? And one is that, um, you know, like, the, that's been going on for a while is the power of the consumer, right? Like, mm -hmm. n like salespeople used to have all the keys to the castle. You know, they had all the knowledge. You had to go to, through sales, right? Um, but like everywhere in our life, that's disappearing. Um, except for maybe like, I don't know, when you buy a mattress. That's like one that's interesting. That Well, no, that's changed. Mattress has changed. Maybe real estate hasn't changed as much. But like all these businesses are changing where salespeople are, you know, don't have the power they held over consumers, one. Two, I think is um, in B2B tech, like everything's getting consumerized. That started with bring your own device, right? Like it used to be like when there was all this big question of like, can you have a smartphone, your own smartphone at work? Like that's not an issue anymore. Um, it used to be that the buyer and the user in B2B technology were completely separated. Um, you know, when I worked in ed tech, that was really interesting. It was that the administration bought the software, but then teachers and students had to use it. And what the administration cared about was totally different than teachers and students. And there's a shift now where like in ed tech and all these other places, all these other, you know, B2B spaces where you're not going to the admin, you're going to the user. And so the user experience matters, right? Um, and like when you start investing in the user experience, you can start to get to a, 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 a something going on and experiencing your software that enables purchase, that leads to value immediately. So those are kind of like two like trends that have happened where the purchase gets de-risked, right? Mm -hmm. So people want to de-risk the purchase in B2B. And that's why it started to take off there. And I think there's like a third reason that a lot of people don't think about, and it's that software is starting to mature, right? Like we're, you know, like the dot com bubble was like 20 years ago, right? This is it's much crazy. more mature, and, Absolutely. right? Isn't that crazy to think about? <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, I remember I got into the internet, in, into particular startups um, around 2001, and it's been 20 years. It's, and we were talking about Wi-Fi, 
like setting up wireless networks. Actually, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, working That's on a startup doing. on the side, and then I had a daytime job. And so to your point around consumerization, we were selling like on-prem software and I, I would go in post sales and train the team. That was my day job. And in the evenings, I was trying to like get people to install wireless internet networks, right? Oh my As gosh. my side gig. So right. totally. So what's happened in those 20 years is two things. One, the big, like really successful players have gotten massive and super entrenched, right? So competing against them is hard. Um, in the same front, like all, all of the like easy channels and ways to grow a new business are much more competitive than they, they have been, right? Like you used to be able to do things like run really cheap Facebook ads. Now Facebook ads are much more expensive. Like all these other, you know, like ways of getting to growth have been hacked and, and gotten competitive. And so as startups and, and growth businesses are looking for new ways to disrupt the big players and, and to grow um, in the B2B world, it's just like, this is an inevitable place that people are going to because it's a really efficient way to grow your business. So Absolutely. I think that's like the final kind of trend that's, that's really heated things up here. Well, there's this statement that I've been asking folks, uh, which was, or a question I should say, was like for the folks out there who think that PLG is going to displace or eliminate sales folks or salespeople, what mm. would you say? Because I know that's a, you know, sort of a concern of a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's such a normal, like it, it's a very uh, kind of normal response coming from sales teams. Um, because it's a different way of going to market. It's a different way of selling. And a key part of that is, is you know, being able to purchase an app. Now, not every product like growth strategy has that, but many do. Um, but I, th and so I think there's a natural hesitation. And I had an experience when we were at Matcha, we were a business that um, was essentially like an agency that was technology enabled, right? And then we transformed from that to a really like a true product led growth experience. And I remember going through and working with our VP of sales to figure out one, how are we gonna get him and the rest of his team excited and on board with this? And then two, um, like, what were we gonna do to make sure that they were gonna be successful? And I think the first thing is that you've, um, you've got to remind, I think, sales that, um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll put it this way. Sales will, like when, when you can purchase an app, um, that makes sales really uncomfortable. They kind of hate that. Hmm. <laughs> and I think the way that I, I deal with that is like, first of all, I remind them like, look, you're competing against the guy or woman sitting neck right next to you, right? That salesperson, but you don't hate them. You work collaboratively with them. Now I know this is technology and someone buying online is like not a person sitting next to you, but this is another, this is another salesperson, right? And so we need to support those salespeople and helping them think about how do they provide additional value beyond the self service purchase. Right. That's the first thing. And then the, the, the next thing is letting them know, like, look, you, those are probably lower value customers and we want to get you focused on the right customers and actually having product led growth will help us get you focused on the right customers. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's like you, you have to, there's definitely some hearts and minds. And I think there's a lot of like lack of understanding of how product like growth works from a sales perspective. Yeah. Well, I think that, for example, as a salesperson that was selling, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking about this particular instance. I've spoken about it a, a little bit, maybe about 13 years ago or so in, in New York City. And I remember I sort of hated the long tail or product led for a period. Now I've obviously changed my mind. Um, for a variety of reasons, but I hated it because every time I would call up uh, a large brand like Pepsi or, you know, I don't know, Microsoft or whatever, 
I'd get this objection like, oh yeah, we know you we're, we're using your like $15 a month thing. Right. And we're Mm -hmm. happy with it. Right. And in my mind, that's actually product led executed incorrectly. Right. Where they didn't think about how that long tail or that, you know, small uh, package or tier would affect the mid-market enterprise team. And so I think that's where a lot of the aggression, at least in Mm -hmm. my personal experience, came from. Now, if product-led is executed properly, if incentives were aligned properly, and the funnel and sort of the the infrastructure around funneling, you know, MQLs and PQLs and all that kind of good stuff, if your strategy essentially is put together properly, then it shouldn't be a problem. I remember chatting with a sales leader at a, a big popular Asana. I've talked about this a little bit because I thought the strategy was so fantastic. It was like, Hey, sales folks, don't worry about like the small long tail. We're going to go product led there. And of course, when they started this, when I had this conversation, this was before open view did the whole PLG thing. And so it was like, we're just going to let people into the product. And when they hit a certain tier of usage, then reach out. And in fact, we're not going to incentivize you or, uh, or you know, add any commission around anything below this tier. So you don't even give a shit. So of course, salespeople didn't even care, right? They're like, okay, great. Until it hits this you know, tier in usage, we don't care. And so that started to create a different dynamic. And I think organizations that think that way where product and sales teams are aligned in the entire strategy, then you'll be able to get around these things. If you're having conversations or strategies in silo, you're going to have these problems, you know? So that's sort of what I observed. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. It's like the, that experience you described of calling on the customer, then being, Nope, I already bought online. And then just the salesperson being so frustrated is so common. And I think what like companies often miss is that that's actually a, a huge opportunity right? Because there's a few like basics of like selling that are going on. One, someone who's already bought from you is more likely to buy from you again. So a salesperson should love that they can call on someone who is already a customer than someone who's totally net new and you got to explain the whole value prop. They already know the value prop to some degree, right? So then what's missing that that salesperson doesn't? Like, why is that salesperson frustrated? Well, it's because they don't have a value add story. They don't have an upsell that they could, you know, deliver to the customer, right? And they probably don't have the training that they need to be able to add value at that point, right? Historically, that's when sales value ended after the sale. With product like growth, salespeople need to um, be able to sell across, uh, across the entire customer life cycle. And that's new. And then the second part is that they, because of that, they probably need to know the product a lot better, right? And how to use it. And that's another area that they can really add value. So like even in that scenario and where there's that overlap, there's an opportunity. I think the second thing you said was, is absolutely true. It's like, you know, can you set incentives up so that, you know, you're, you're getting the right opportunities and, and, you know, people in front of the right salespeople. That's, an, that's another part of it. But I think there's a lot of opportunity that's missed by salespeople or because of a misunderstanding or just like, maybe there's bad enablement. I don't know, mm-hmm. but like, there's a lot there. Yeah. Totally. Well, let's talk about ABM, given that you are one of the folks that helped launch, you know, the leader in ABM, right? That's what I would say. Uh, Terminus was absolutely uh, the leader in that space. And yeah, I know there are a couple of folks who have emerged, but uh, I'm going to give that to, to you folks. You know, given that you come from Terminus, how do you start to think about sort of joining ABM mm-hmm. with product led. My buddy, Dave Rigotti over in Seattle uh, wrote Mm. a post last night. I don't know if you know Dave, uh, but he was, um, I forgot the startup that he was at. It was (laughs) visible. I think it was called. Yes. Yes. Visible. Yep. Yeah. So you, Oh, and you were saying he, uh, well, I was just going to say post. Yeah. He wrote a post last night around, Hey everyone, like ABM and PLG should coexist. They're not, you know, they don't have to be separate, right? And in fact, mm-hmm. if you can bring them together, you got a really potent strategy. Yeah, it's, um, this is, I think, like the, 
this is going to be, I think, in the next year, two years, something that like I think you're going to see exploding in uh, you know B two B selling and marketing. Um, it's yeah, like so. Okay, so uh, at Terminus, as you, as you mentioned, like we were kind of pioneering account based marketing. We're out there trying to like transform how mark b2b marketers market it right from you know this lead gen focus to focusing on accounts um and all the while there was like product like growth was kind of coming up as like somewhere else right like and it's cool to see them them really converge and i think they converge in in such a nice way and i really think it's going to be the future of enterprise selling um, let's see. So like, maybe just start like, what is ABM, right? It's about it, the most basic level. It's about targeting the right people, the right accounts that you want to sell to instead of just bringing in anybody, uh, and their cousin into the funnel and passing, passing them on to sales, right? It's about getting focused on the most valuable prospects, most valuable potential customers and making sure that sales and marketing are working together on them. So then that's the second part, it's about collaboration, aligning marketing and sales uh, to work together so that you know, you're super efficient with your resources and you're winning more deals. So that, that's kind of like the basics of ABM. Um, and I think this is where, like if you think about the basics of ABM is where like product like growth integrates well. So to know who to target, Historically, in ABM, companies have you know purchased data and look at looked at their customer base and you know maybe use like some sort of AI algorithm to like predict who which other accounts are most like their best customers, and that's all great. That's a great way to identify who is good, a good fit for you, and then maybe you'd see like who is also checking out your eBooks, right? Well, now with product like growth, you can add this layer of who's actually using your product and are they liking and loving and getting value out of your product, right? So if you know who your best customers are, like from a, like a marketing standpoint as we're talking about, and then you know that there's people in there who love the product and are using it, that right there is like, that's who sales needs to be talking to. They need to get on the phone to that champion and, and, and go. And so to me, it's, it's, there's this just natural blending of like the core basics of ABM and product like growth. Um, and I think it's what's been needed. I think like one of the critiques of product like growth is that it's not people who are resistant to it say, well, I sell into the enterprise, uh, large enterprises, and it's never going to work there. Um, I've got to, you know, go through infosec people and all this, but it's, it's, it's actually proving out to those objections are not, not accurate. And it's actually, I think, enhancing uh, companies' abilities to penetrate enterprises. Yeah, totally. I, I always tell the story of a moment where I worked at Twitter and I remember sitting down with the, at the time, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO, Matt Bellows at Yesware. And mm. I told this story a couple of times and Matt was like, dude, we, apparently we got tons of people swiping their credit card for whatever, it was 15 bucks a month. And, uh, and so we saw a bunch of usage in domains from Twitter using our tool. And now we're here. Of course, he was a buddy of mine. So, in, uh, cause I was like, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, yeah, we're doing an enterprise deal. Right. And so it's absolutely not true. It's just about how you sort of deploy it. And, you know, the other thing that we're advocating here at Reprise is product led, as you know, you know, we met in the, the round table and thank you so much for providing insight. I, yeah. When I heard you speaking, I was like, I got to get Thomas on the show. So thank you. And uh, the other thing is, yeah, it doesn't have to be very top of the funnel, right? Even if you have a web form, you can go into product led, after the top of the funnel entry point, right? And so, you know, that might look like, of course, what we do or some other version of that. I don't know, whatever you want to use, you know, uh, in, in Vision, Figma, some competitor, that's fine, you know, but the idea is that you are now going product-led and really giving folks the, an opportunity to dig in to your product, irrespective of where it uh, is inserted in the sales motion. So, you know, 
that's uh, I think just for for enterprise or mid market company leaders out there, you can absolutely go product led. Thomas, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I, I don't want to hold you up too much because I feel like we can sit here and talk for the next few hours yeah. on this. If you had one actionable tip, right, mm. for one of these organizations around going product led, you've moved from sales led to product led. So you got a lot of experience there. You know, I know there's a thousand tips that probably come to mind, but if you have one that they could implement like tomorrow or start mm. on the journey, what, what would that be? So can I give you two tips? Sure. Two tips. Um, okay. So I think the first tip, um, having done this transformation from scratch and then also come into been part of businesses where product like growth was where they started. I think the f first piece of advice I would give is take an incremental approach, right? Don't try to solve the whole product led growth process and funnel in one go. And I think where most people start on that incremental path to a, a bigger product led growth strategy is with onboarding. So make onboarding automated and in the product, um, start there and then you can expand up the funnel, down the funnel. That's, that's I think the place to start from my experience. Second piece of advice uh, that kind of goes against this incremental approach is um, invest in data as early as possible, right? Like the, one of the biggest challenges with product like growth is that product data and marketing and selling data are in two different silos and the tools out there, there's not a lot of tools out there that make it easy to bring them together. And so that's an area to invest in early and I think go big. So those are my, my two, my two tips. Awesome. And I just have to give you a, a huge shout out for having that strategy around onboarding, just absolutely elegant and beautiful. I'm going to write a blog post about it uh, coming up soon. It is really in incredible. Thomas, if folks want to follow you on social media or maybe learn more about job opportunities at Mural, what are the yep. best URLs or social handles to, uh, to reach you? Yeah, so um, we are hiring aggressively at Mural. Um, the product marketing team is expanding. Um, coming, that's coming soon. So if you're looking for product marketing opportunities, hit us up. Um, you can check out our website, mural.co, M-U-R-A-L.co. And I'm on LinkedIn as well as Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at TLShields, S-H-I-E-L-D-S. And so I'd love to hear from folks um, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Cool. Well, have a wonderful afternoon and uh, hope to see you soon in person. Fantastic. Thanks for the time. And uh, it's great to chat. Likewise. Take care.